Music helps us understand our lives, which are, can be very confusing. <laughs> we don't even know why we're here, you know? It, it, we go through life with so many questions unanswered, there's a lot of confusion. And music helps you make sense out of it. If you have no roots, you can't create anything meaningful that's new, you know? It's just going to be noise, really. So what's happening at Firehoff is a really big deal because this music is so important to not just to it's called americana but it, it's appreciated all over the world what's going on here at farhoff is a beautiful thing it's 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 a uh, it's really going to be beneficial to our culture it's going to it's going to entertain people and it's going to educate people, and it's going to preserve a great part of American musical history. And I'm just honored to be a small part of that. All right. Well, hello. Welcome, everyone. Oh, oh it's playing again. OK. Uh, we, it could be a soundtrack, that's fine too. Um, <laughs> welcome everyone, we are so happy to have you here today. My name is Ashley Spankre, I'm the board president for Folk Alliance International, and I'm really delighted to be introducing this next session. Um, the wisdoms of the elder panel's intent is to share and celebrate the stories of the community figures who have blazed trails for all of us. And for me as a person coming from New Orleans, Learning the wisdom of my elders has been the way that I've been able to connect to music and community in a deep, rich way and understand things that I could never understand before. And so I'm really delighted to be here and, and to introduce all of you. And without much further ado, so I don't keep talking, I'm going to turn it on over to, to our interviewer for today, Mary Sue Tua. Thank you, Ashley. So excited to be here with you, and we're going to start with a land acknowledgement. Folk Alliance International acknowledges that all of its activities take place on ancestral indigenous lands. Folk Alliance International's office is located on the traditional land of the Kansai, Ka, Osage, Kickapoo, and others. So let us just take a, a moment. Welcome to the Wisdom of the Elders. Really special panel here. My first one I'll say was uh, at the uh, encouragement of the late Gene Shea of WXPN. He said, Mary Sue, you have to go to this Wisdom of the Elders. And there on stage, we saw Sunny Oaks as a wonderful host. I was transfixed. It was a great day, and I'm so honored to be here Thank you, Jean. Thank you. <laughs> Today, uh, we do uh, get to celebrate and get to know these three artists, all deeply dedicated to their artistry, each wearing more than one hat and recognized with awards and album charting and more, all performing right now releasing music right now, and quite busy in their music careers right now. So please give Deirdre McCullough, Reverend Robert Jones, and Ken Whiteley a warm welcome. There is not enough time to cover one of these artists in the next hour, so we're gonna move along quite quickly. And I'm encouraging these artists to talk to each other, so if you see that, we're all for it, all right? So our first artist, Deirdre McCullough, is from Georgia. You may have heard her name a bunch lately because her album, Endless Grace, just charted 
number 13 on the 2022 FAI Folk Chart. Woohoo! Thank you. First album in 20 years for her, and she is conservatory trained, released albums on women's music label Olivia Records, a published author and co founder of Family Pride of the South, an organization for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender families. So we're, we're starting on a theme of beginnings. Deirdre, can you tell us about your beginnings? Can you please call the slide of Deirdre's photos? Yes, evidently there are pictures. Um, guitar got in my hand. Um, actually, the, the picture of number two is a freshman at, at college, but the guitar got into my hand in high school. Um, my mom was a waitress. My dad worked in a warehouse, but both of them were committed to education and opportunity, and they decided, rather than leave me to the vagaries of the public school system of New York, that I needed to go to boarding school. So I went to an all-girls Catholic boarding school. Um, I was the first black student at this school. She actually, my mom talked the nuns into letting her pay monthly so that I could go there because, you know, they were just uh, working people. But that's where, you know, in my seventh grade self that had a household that was, you know, filled with the music of Motown and, and R&B met Joan Baez and Simon and Garfunkel and Progressive FN Rock. So uh, in high school, I formed a, a folk trio, but only one of us played guitar. And I decided, I, you know, I taught myself to uh, play guitar. And I also discovered theater in high school, went on to a scholarship at Vassar College and played on the college campuses. A friend from high school was shopping me around record companies at that point, but um, somehow or another, through a back door, I wound up with a record deal with Roulette Records, home of Tommy James and the Shondells, for those of us who are old enough to remember. So I had an album that came out um, at 19, uh, which was an interesting experience. Um, the promotion person that went around the country promoting it uh, reported back to me that the white stations would look at the cover and say, oh, we don't play R&B, and the black stations would put the, the record on the turntable. Um, but once they heard it, they went, oh, she, she sounds white. <laughs> um, so I got, you know, very little airplay uh, anywhere. But it taught me it, a lot about the music industry, took the stardust out of my eyes about the music industry, but it never killed my love of performance. And when I graduated um, in 1975, the whole second wave of feminism was happening, and this was the birth of the cultural phenomena that they came to be known as women's music. And that's what I you know, emerged into at that time. And I don't know how many of you have even heard the term women's music, but it was this incredible um, network of the, the musicians were just the tip of the iceberg. It was really about bringing a community, uh, targeting uh, specifically the lesbian community, because before that we were so isolated um, and met each other, I don't know, at bars and baseball fields, softball teams and such. Um, and women's music, you know, over the, the arc of its existence, there were over 130 um, women's production companies around the country. And, it, you know, Janice in re reference that when she was coming up, they weren't women in positions of power in the industry. And that's really what women's music was setting out to give women experience behind the scene and being in the decision-making power. So there were women's production companies. I always kept my foot in the folk world, but and there were thankfully many folk venues that opened their doors to us and became allies, places like the Ark in Ann Arbor or the Freight and Salvage or Folk City uh, in, in New York. There were women's production companies, there were three record companies, there, was a, there were two uh, quarterly journals that came out, uh, Paid My Dues and, and Hotwire. There were distributors for our records and there are women's radio shows that some of which still existed. So I graduated into that. Um, went back to school because I realized I had taught myself guitar and I kind of skipped the theory part um, and I realized I needed that. So I went, you know, I was in a jazz rock band in Milwaukee, went to New York um, and hung out at Folk City and somehow or another became their main sound engineer, which was kind of unusual for uh, women at that time. And in 1985, I got hooked up with Olivia Records and did my first independent album, 
with them and worked with Olivia for 11 years. So that's kind of the shortened version of my arc. Ooh, just the beginning, right? Oh my goodness, that is amazing. Um, quick question, when you were recording as a college student at Vassar, yes. so be you were a student in these big, slick recording studios, just a snapshot of what that was like. You, you know, it's, it, it, like I said, it was eye-opening ab about the industry because that level of the industry, the album I f it is done around you and you're just a cog in the wheel. So I remember being off in an isolation room. I um, was doing, they were doing one of my songs. They brought in an arranger, Lee Holdridge, who had worked with John Denver and Neil Diamond. So he was really hot at the time and he had arranged the songs and we started you know, taping one song and I wasn't coming in. And the producer came on and said, okay, Deirdre, uh, we'll try that again and you come in. And they started the song again and I still didn't come in. And he finally said, is there something wrong? And I was practically in tears off in my isolation booth. And I was like, he's arranged this song. I don't even know where I'm supposed to come in anymore. You know, the, 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 it was taken away from me. Thankfully, for, to the producer's credit, he realized that that method of working wasn't, work, wasn't working for me. After those three songs, he you know, said, Lee, thank you very much. And the rhythm section and I worked out the remainder of the songs, but that's what the industry is like. You're, you're just a piece. And I think it was important and, and very important that I learned that at an early age. Also too, just quickly, the, um, it, it sounds like you are illustrating that the women's uh, movement had created a parallel industry, yes. a parallel music industry. Most and definitely, had to. yeah, had and, to. And, and had to because women were just the singers, but we were not the decision makers. We weren't the engineers. We weren't. Um, it, the, the title was called an A and R artist and repertoire for a man uh, was the title. We weren't in the decision making pod, and women's music wanted to change that. Awesome. Reverend Robert Jones, tell me a little bit about the beginning days. Like maybe, well, I'll let you decide. Well, musically, um, one of the most pivotal things I can remember is my grandmother who had, you know, I, I don't know how many people had a cool grandmother like mine, but she had a Magnavox stereo with eight speakers. And when she put a record on, the whole neighborhood got to enjoy the record, right? So she, she would bring home everything from James Cleveland, Aretha Franklin, to Lightning Hopkins, to Wilson Pickett, and the whole nine. But one day she brought home a record by Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. And she said, this is the music we used to listen to down south. And she was so excited about it. And she played that record over and over and over again. Brownie, the... the guitar player and Sonny, of course, the great harmonica player. And um, I didn't know it, but I, I jokingly say I was getting infected because I went to some music store and got a harmonica, later on went and got a pawn sh to a pawn shop and got a guitar and was playing along with this music. I didn't know why it struck me. I guess it was the immediacy of it and that kind of thing. Taught myself how to play on a really rudimentary level, like, you know, theory. <laughs> but um, it was, it was a cool thing. Um, but then when I got to college, um, I, was, I had a work-study job, and um, it meant that you, you, know, you got your financial aid, but you had to work for part of it. And the last job on the list was the university's public radio station, WDET, in Detroit. And I went there, and lo and behold, the general manager hired me to be an accounting clerk. When I... <laughs> When I finished being an accounting clerk, you know, I'd go upstairs and there was this massive library of, with names like Mississippi John Hurt and Sun House and Lightning Hopkins and all of these really cool people. And before I knew it, I was like getting these records and bringing them home. My grand, same grandmother put it on the turntable at his Sun House and he's going, and but one kind of blues, the real blues. The B-L-U-E-S blues. Everything else is monkey chunk. <laughs> and my grandmother goes, that's what we moved from down south to get away from. So 
at that point, I was like fully infected with this blues thing. But unlike Deirdre, I have been totally outside the whole idea of recording industry. Um, for me, it's been kind of like, I met Willie Dixon at a, at a formative period and he was going around doing something called blues in schools and teaching kids about the importance of blues and, and black music. And that's what captured my imagination. And I, by then, had a family. And I, I didn't want my son to ever say, you were never there for me. You didn't come to any of my games and that kind of stuff. So I was really blessed to have a career that's really sort of outside the recording industry. Careers, right? Multiple. Yeah, careers. And it's, it's like you, you have to let the music serve you, and you also have to serve the music. So I've been really blessed to do a lot of great things in the educational community, in the storytelling community, and, and ultimately in the music community. You're celebrating a very important year in your ministry as pastor. Right. I've been a pastor of Sweet Kingdom Missionary Baptist Church for like 20 years uh, in March. And, <laughs> and it's funny because I almost didn't get called to, to pastor the church because of the music. We had, uh, my pastor had pancreatic cancer and, and passed away suddenly in 99. And um, we went through this upheaval, like church politics is like sausage. You might like the taste, but you don't want to see it being made, right? <laughs> and so people had all of these attitudes about what is a blues musician like? What does a blues musician do? And folks were like dead set against me because I was a blues musician. But there was another guy who had been married several times and there was another kid who was like 18 years old and so just a little bit too young. And there was another associate minister who was a workaholic. So after four years of upheaval, they came back around to me and figured maybe blues ain't that bad. <laughs> and uh, and uh, but still, you know, there were people who, who had this had this uh, suspicion or this ambivalence about uh, about this music. But because I think it's always for me it's been about education and about cultural awareness that I've managed to ride those waves, and I, I think my people still love me after 20 years. Can you tell us about uh, Common Chords? Yeah, Common Chords. My buddy out here, Matt Watroba and I, met at that radio station, and I used to have a show called Blues from the Lowlands, which was acoustic, traditional blues. That's where I first met Ken. And, uh, and uh, he had a show called Folks Like Us. And in the crossover, we got to know each other. Then we got a gig playing together at a music store. Remember music stores with records and stuff? And uh, in a very affluent suburb of Detroit called Gross Point. And I knew blues and Matt knew folk. And we're like, what are we gonna do? And we realized both of us were exposed to country music. So we played country all night. <laughs> and and, and that, what, that's sort of the genesis of what is now our nonprofit called Common Chords, you know, the chords we have in common. And it's about the idea of celebrating the things that we have in common instead of fighting about the things that we differ on. And we do educational programs and we do non-diversity, diversity programs. And, and, you know, this is a period where we really need to celebrate one another in all of our diversity because there are forces of raid that are trying to separate us even more than we were. So it's important for us to come together. So, yeah. Can you tell me about the 20, yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. The 2018, uh, you are the 2018 recipient of the Kresge Arts Fellowship for Music Composition and Performance. Yeah, the, the Kresge Foundation in Detroit is pretty, pretty big. Um, and, and they really celebrate local artists of all descriptions and writers and painters and musicians, and they identify a number of Kresge fellows. Um, and in 2018, I was honored to be one of them. You get, you know, um, $25,000 that you can do whatever you need to do with or you want to do with. And, but more importantly, you get a chance to um, come together and do collaboration and mentor each other and be mentored by 
other musicians. And, you know, that's really been a, a blessing to be one of, I think there are only like 150 of us in the 12, 13 year history of it. So yeah, that's, that was a great honor. I like that. And one more thing, um, you are a nationally recognized storyteller. Yeah. Um, <laughs> In Michigan, storytelling is not a big thing, and I don't know about, you know, other states, but in the South, it's a big thing. And uh, I was invited to the uh, National Storytelling Festival in Jonesboro, Tennessee, as a first-time teller. And I didn't realize it, but my friend Matt said, you know, that's like being a baseball player starting off at the World Series. And it, and it really has been a, a, a real blessing to be in the presence of iconic storytellers like Donald Davis and the late Catherine Wyndham and, you know, so many other, Bill Lepp. And uh, the idea is that down south, you know, up north, if you ask a question, you get an answer. Down south, if you ask a question, you get a story. So, uh, you know, it's kind of the music is a p big part of my storytelling. I, I love songs that tell stories and I love stories that set up songs. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm just blessed to have this wonderful mishmash of a life that allows me to do some really interesting things. <laughs> That's awesome. Ken, Ken Whiteley, seven-time Juno nominee, record producer, label founder, has 33 albums of his own, has produced and been a part of 150 albums. Um, programmed the Mariposa Folk Festival three times by 1980 and is in the Mariposa Folk Festival Hall of Fame. And with all that, he's a certified yoga instructor. Namaste. How do you do it, namaste? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. It's, it's such an honor to be here and share the stage with all you folks. And, you know, I started my... Uh, I can't really remember when I started. I know when I, I was born in the United States, but uh, my parents were Canadian. And when I just turned five, we moved back from Kansas to, to Toronto. And at that time, there weren't interstates. So this was a much longer drive in those days. This is, we're talking 1956, spring of 56. And we sang all the way, you know, we, we sang in the car all the way. And, and a little later, my grandfather came uh, to live with us. He had been living uh, by himself uh, in Victoria. And um, he was born in 1874 in Northern Ontario. And he grew up at a time pre-recording, pre, you know, where every, if any, every community had to produce their own entertainment and stuff like that. And he would tell us stories and he would, you would always have to be ready because there would be a family gathering and he would say, Ken, give us a song, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that kind of thing, right? So um, my dad sang in the choir at church and, and uh, so there was always, you know, he played, he, it was kind of funny because once, my, my, I have an older brother who's three years older, which was a big advantage for me, and you'll hear some of the things that I did if you ever get a chance, you know, like, one, you know, it was because I went with Chris, my older brother, I got to go to some of these things that I wouldn't have otherwise been. So, like, in 1964, the Mariposa Folk Festival was, which had started up in Orillia, and the week before the festival was to happen, the Orillia Town Council passed a bylaw forbidding it to happen in Orillia. And so, at the last minute, they had to change the venue, and they had it at the at Maple Leaf Stadium, the Toronto ballpark where the Toronto Maple Leafs of the International League baseball team played. And um, so I got to go to that because my brother and I would go to baseball games and we were like begging, you know, can we go to this? So we were already, you know, big folk music fans. We'd already been hooked, you know, and we went very quickly from, you know, the folk music that was on the radio, Peter, Paul and Mary, Kingston Trio. And then very quickly we discovered, oh, Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, you know, like blowing the wind. Oh, that was really by Bob Dylan. Oh, who is this Bob Dylan guy? You know, and all this sort of stuff. So we were primed and ready. So in, in 1963, I'm this chubby 13-year-old, 
and um, you know, I get to see Mississippi John Hurt and Reverend Gary Davis meet each other for the first time in the dugout at Maple Leaf Stadium. And, they're, and they are both so excited because John Hurt has only recently been rediscovered. Gary Davis has been living in New York for years, decades, and te you know, started teaching. You know, he's been part of this folk scene. You know, and, uh, but anyway, they're meeting. And then Richard Waterman, who had rediscovered uh, Gary Davis, or G had rediscovered John Hurt, had just, like, 18 days before rediscovered Skip James. Mm -hmm. And he brought Skip James to Mariposa because the following week they were all going to, Mar to uh, Newport. And he didn't want to throw him in the big pond until he'd at least got his feet wet. So on the Sunday night, I came home from seeing this weekend and I'm, and I go, I'd rather be the devil <laughs> than be my woman's man. You know, and uh, my mother goes, Ken, what are you saying? You know, this is like so bizarre. Ken. And I, this image was later that summer, we convinced a family trip that would make a detour to the Philadelphia Folk Festival. And I got to meet Sun House. And it's like, you know, and I was like, OK, I have to get a slide guitar. I have to play resophonic guitar. And, you know, so, I, you know, I, so at the age of 13, this, this not only did I want to be a, a folk singer, but I wanted to be an old blues singer. So I'm kind of working up to it. I'm getting, uh, you know, ramping up to this. So looking at your photo, can we bring up Ken's slide? Um, I wanted to ask you about, thank you, the, um, the picture with you holding an auto harp. Yeah, yeah, so that's me right after that. Like, uh, you know, I, so there was a woman named Estelle Klein who, who was the artistic director for many years of, the, of Mariposa and, she, and also the president of what was called the Toronto Folk Guild, and they would do concerts. They did a Monday night hoot, and um, we, she basically took us uh, took us under her wing, and you know we were interested. We were musical. We you know, and so like she introduced me to Mike Seeger when I was 14. You know, she he was playing at a club in Toronto and. And, and had us come and give an opening set for Mike. And, uh, you know, so I, 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 you know, by the time I was 15 or 16, we had, you know, I had the first dulcimer in, dulc in, that I ever saw. I, somebody was going to Kentucky and I said, you gotta get me a dulcimer, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and they, you know, anyway, so I grew up and I always wanted, I played piano, I was, it was kind of funny, the, you know, in, I had taken piano lessons, but I never practiced piano. And then in the summer, when I was, didn't have to take lessons anymore, that's when I learned, like, you know, like a Rolling Stone on the piano and stuff like that. And, you know, and then I, it's a, but it's always a, I always, I think that it, you're always trying to learn. It's not a, it's not a static thing. And, and, you know, so, so many experiences that were seminal that I had to get, to a point where I was good enough to deserve that experience, you could say, that, you know, so in the 70s, um, meeting blind John Davis, who was a great blues piano player, the house piano player for Bluebird Records in the late 30s, early 40s. And, you know, we became friends. We started backing him up. We became friends and he, we, I'd set up tours. He would come up to, to Canada and we'd travel around. I started going down to the States and doing gigs with him there and, you know, and, and you, uh, you know, so you, I guess things happen when you're ready. I was, uh, when we, in 1966, my brother and I got a, a tape recorder from our parents because we, you know, wanted to, to make tapes and, and uh, it had what was called sound on sound, which is like a sync head. So you could, we could both play something on first pass and then we could play along with ourselves on the, on the second pass. So at, at the age of 14, I started writing songs and making these tapes with my brother. And uh, on and on it goes. Okay, that's a great segue to our next theme, 1973-ish, ish. We're going back 50 years. Um, Vietnam has just ended. Uh, Supreme Court has ruled on Roe versus Wade. 
and Sydney Opera House has opened. What's going on with you? Deirdre, let's start with you. I realized a while ago that 1973 was a watershed year for me. I'm kind of working backwards. Um, in that fall, I, uh, I told you I was a theater major at Vassar. I attended the National Theater Institute, which totally reshaped my connection to performance. In that spring, that's when that album from Roulette Records came out. Um, it's called Fur Coats and Blue Jeans. Um, you can actually find it on eBay uh, these days. But that came out in, in May of 1973. And in February of, of 1973, I think it's the first picture uh, on my slide, that's, that's when, 50 years ago this month that I count, the start of my life as a, as a performing songwriter because that was the first time I was ever paid to, uh, to do a coffee house. It was at a coffee house at a Catholic high school in Poughkeepsie, in Poughkeepsie and I was paid $50 and they treated me like I was Elvis, you know? And so it was ab absolutely um, amazing. And then uh, as a personal aside, 1973 was the year that my young heart fell in love for the very first time. And on that very night of that very first professional gig that I ever had was the night that she and I acknowledged how we felt about each other. And so in queer community parlance, 1973 was the year I came out. It was a great year. <laughs> you know? That is, congratulations. Yes. yes. Wonderful. Okay, so 1973, Ken, tell me about that, or Ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Uh, it, yeah, because it was it was really a sort of a cascading series of events. So, um, my brother and I and a friend of mine who was in junior high school, who was from a Macedonian background, and he, when we started grade seven together, he already played mandolin and violin and was taking clarinet and and so the the three of us started a group, uh, a jug band, uh, and that eventually morphed into a group called the Original Sloth Band. And so my brother and I actually played Mariposa in 1969 in the new songwriters concert. So when I, I went from, from summer school, because I'd failed French in grade 12, and I had to go to summer school to make it, make it up. So I like had to leave summer school and then buzz down to Toronto Island, you know, because I was performing at Mariposa. But um, 72, we played at, at Mariposa and that opened a bunch of doors for us. We then began touring outside of just the, G the greater Toronto area, uh, going to other places in, in um, you know, southern Ontario. There's a whole coffee house scene, music scene. And, and in 73, we released our first recording. And I mentioned how I was always fascinated by that process. I'd already been in recording studios. Um, I sang was part of like a you know get a bunch of people in to sing on the choruses of a song with the Beers family if anyone remembers they or their Fox Hollow festival and stuff. Um, so we made this. Uh, I'd been making tapes with my friend Graham Jones, another friend from high school, and he wanted to get into recording, so he got you know a a a, a, a four, Studer four track tape recorder and no I. I I guess he started with just the two track and we and so we recorded it with four microphones live off the floor that came out in 73 um, yeah so 73 was big 74 was really when uh, inspired by Mariposa uh, and Mitch Podolik started the Winnipeg Folk Festival and then all of a sudden just as we were kind of coming out all of these opportunities to play across the country opened up. So it, it, was, it was right at this kind of pivot point. We should make note um, with your recording on your four track that that was not digital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, it's not. No, it, and I still use, an, you know, when recording, I still use an, an analog mixing console and, and awesome. stuff like that. But yeah, we're recording on computers now. And, the other thing too, can you tell us a little bit about touring back then? It's much different than today, really, isn't well, it? Well, you know, with the original Sloth Band, the whole thing with that group was that, you know, all of us played a whack of instruments. So I would be playing piano and tenor banjo and five-string banjo and, 
and uh, regular acoustic guitar and slide guitar and accordion. And my brother was playing trumpet and harmonica and guitar and Tom was playing ukulele and mandolin and fiddle and clarinet and saxophone. And, and, but in those days, we used to, I, used to, I got to know these people who worked at the Air Canada special handling se section of the airport. And you would, we would go up there with five or six instruments each and we would say, you know, and just, you know, load, dump them all on her belt there with her and she'd tag them all, special handling. And once in a while, you know, the, as it gradually began to morph, you know, gradually, she, I may have to charge you ex for a piece of excess, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, you know, we were still taking six, seven things with us in those days and just part of the, uh, the ticket. So it, it was, you know, that was... I would say that's one of the biggest things is just how traveling has become a lot more arduous for that kind of stuff. I mean, coming here, like, do I bring a six-string guitar or a 12-string guitar? I'm going to Folk Alliance. I'm not getting paid. I, I don't want to pay too much excess baggage. You know, all these kinds of considerations that were never a consideration back then. Exactly. And obviously also pre-cell phone. So communicating with family when you're on the road, completely different and you're staying usually in the town a little bit longer than touring artists do today. Yeah. All of that. <laughs> right. What was the, what did you ask a question there? What, what was? Um, well, it was more like the, the how touring has changed. I mean, the basic thing, you know, when you're a touring musician, the thing is really all about, you know, the two hours you spend with people in a room. And that doesn't change. You're connecting. You're making a connection. You're trying to, to create something that, where we all, you know, experience something together. And you're the vehicle to allow that to happen. And that doesn't change, you know. But a lot of the stuff around it, maybe that does, you know. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay, we're gonna go to the Reverend Robert Jones, 1973. Where were you? Ish. 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 Because in 73, for me, not a lot was going on, to tell you the truth. I was, I was in high school, and um, I was on the verge of going to college, Wayne State University. But um, I was born and raised on the east side of Detroit. And I got to think, what's well, like 74 is like seven years after the rebellion in Detroit, right? And you've got a lot of stuff going on in terms of race, in terms of coming from the east side of Detroit at a high school to going to Wayne State University, which is a major university that's got a diverse population of everybody. So for the first time, you see faces that don't look like your face. And every school that I had ever been to, when my family moved around a lot, I thought it was because my mother grandmother loved to travel is because they, you know, they couldn't pay the rent and we were getting in, into another place, right? So I get to Wayne State and um, I remember I was there as part of a program called Project 350, which was 350 students drawn from the inner city uh, and put in, in the college on more or less probation. You just, you know, they give you some tutoring, they try to get you up to speed if you were average student maybe and in, in, uh, in the high school they tried to get you up to speed to go to college but my whole experience being on the east side of Detroit is I showed up at Wayne State with a book bag that had a pair of noon chocks um, and I had a, a, a lock that I was going to use for brass knuck and I had a knife because I knew that at every school I'd ever gone to there had been a fight and I went to Wayne State and nobody was fighting me. And I was like, dude, this is a different kind of fight. Let me get rid of this junk and put some books in my book bag, <laughs> right? Um, so I get to Wayne State, and like I, I mentioned before, I get to work at this public radio station that has this amazing library. And now, with the internet, folks are just, you know, I see John Hurd, I want Sun House, I want Nina Simone, boom, it's right there. Back in the day, you had to like, look for the music, you had to find the album on 
Levels, labels like the Everest record label, right? You know, it might be T-Bone Walker with a picture of Lightning Hopkins on the cover because they all black people looked alike. That, that kind of stuff, right? And, and so it was this idea of if you're going to teach yourself how to play, right? You, you, you got to find some, something that you like and then you sit there and play the record over and over and over and over again and just do the best you can. Find, uh, uh, find Jerry Silverman books and find Stefan Grossman books and they may or may not be right, but that's okay. And you, you just did the work. So, but I realized that that was a really formative period. Um, it was the period where you decided I wanted to learn this. I, I wanted to invest in this. And there was something about being at the university and seeing all of these great iconic artists, not only just black artists, but just iconic American artists, but especially for me, black artists, um, that made me say, if these folks are studying me, maybe I should study myself. And, and fencing? Me, was... Can you tell us a little bit about fencing? Yeah, um, when I was at Wayne State, Wayne State was, maybe still is, a powerhouse when it came to fencing. I am the black man who cannot play basketball. I just bounce it off the top of my head. It's just I cannot play basketball. But I got into Wayne State, and there was a Hungarian fencing coach from Transylvania. His name was Maestro Isvan Donoshi, and he says, Bobby. You are very fast. I think I will make you say better fencer. So here I am from the east side of Detroit, <laughs> learning how to play fencing or do fencing with a saber in my hand. Going home, I was actually stopped by the cops on three occasions to see why this black man was walking down the road, walking down the street with a sword. Right? But it was. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's like. There has been always this curiosity in my life, and I, I thank God for that, just like you were saying, Ken, just like you were saying, Didger. You, you, you constantly want to learn how to do certain things, to be exposed to certain things. And I remember that one day I was getting a lesson from Maestro, and he was, I mean, he, they were we were national champions. He was that kind of serious. And at one point he was saying, come, I give you a lesson. And my arm was already dead from from that whole day of practice. And he says, defend your head. And I missed the parry, and it hit me in the top of the mask. Come on, Bobby, pop. And he hit me again, pop, and he hit me again. About the fourth time, I could see he's getting angry. And he goes, take off your mask. And I took off the mask. He goes, whew, ding, I caught it, ding, I caught it. Like 12, 13 times, right at my head. He'd probably been kicked out of the NCAA now if they knew that, but that's the way he was. And he looks me in the eye and he goes, you must remember, back in the day, fencing was about life and death. Now it is a sport, but it was always life and death. And you must remember that whatever you do in life is life and death. Go hit the showers. That lesson still, <laughs> it's like, whatever you do is ultimately also your life. And death is waiting. So it's all about life and death. So that's an uh, important life lesson that I learned from yeah, a crazy Hungarian fencing coach. Okay, we're going to go to the next theme, and it's kind of a juxtaposition. Um, we're going to start with uh, the hard part. What is the hardest part of your job? And then, first you have to choose the job. <laughs> That's the hard part, too. And then go to a shining moment. Um, let's see, why don't we start with Deirdre? Um, yeah, it really is a matter of, of what job, because as you know, most of you, all of you who are artists know that we wear so many hats, and there are so many pieces to take to, to, to that have to be done. It's just, and we're the ones to do it. Um, I am, when I'm working, I can do this business and be out and about, but socially, I'm really shy. It's hard for me to make a dentist appointment. So the aspect, the job that's hardest for me is um, self-booking. Um, in some sense, in the modern age, it's a little easier because emails are a little 
more able to tackle, and everything is done by email now, instead of having to get someone on the phone that you, that's a total cold call. So it's a little easier, but um, I would say that the self-booking part. Um, other hats I can either do myself or farm out. I do a, a little bit of graphic design, but the important stuff, I can hire someone to do it. I work with Carrie Estrin, who did the radio promotion instead of my previous album, you know, doing the promotion, which then was non-existent. Um, I work with Ellen Standing, who did, you know, publicity for me for EFS. So, but there's no one to farm the booking out to. So that's the hardest hat to wear. I'm getting better at it, but um, it, is, it is what it is. And I try not to obsess about it that, you know, things, I haven't gotten to it. So that's the hardest part. Um, as for my shining moment, um, I'm sure a lot of people who have ever gotten to play Carnegie Hall would say Carnegie Hall, uh, which I played with my record company celebrating the 15th anniversary. But um, my, sh my favorite moment, I and mean, there's a picture on the slide of um, I think the last one. I was uh, the act that opened the main stage, the main speaker stage and, and music stage for the 1993 March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights. I was the first performer out there that greeted the marchers at the, as they came in and filled the mall. So I was singing out and looking at the Washington Monument as people were streaming in. Um, I, I looked up um, because I was wondering, well, how many people were there? So I found the Wikipedia page uh, last week on the march and was kind of amused to find that I am quoted on the Wikipedia page for that March on Washington um, because there was some discrepancy, shall we say, about how many people attended that march. And the, the uh, promoters organization said that there were over a million. The DC police said there were um, 800,000. And the Park Service said that there was only 300,000. And I don't know who overheard me say it, um, but I remarked that, of course they said 300,000. Women and people of color are invisible. So, <laughs> um, but really, it, 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 yeah, it was really a grand moment for me. And I only got to, to see um, the video of it in the last couple of years. My, my roommates at home had videotaped it, but then a month later, they taped over it with a football game. But uh, a fan turned me on that if, I, if you uh, Google C-SPAN, March on Washington, 1993, um, there's the whole four hours that C-SPAN recorded. And you'll, you'll see on the picture that it says, uh, you know, uh, Pam Hall, who was the MC at the time. She is black. Um, sometimes I do quip, yeah, we do all look alike. But, you know, uh, in C-SPAN's favor, they had like a ton of speakers and I was the first out and they were just getting organized. But um, it just seeing my community come together in that way was pretty amazing. I did listen to this clip and it gave me chills. Such beautiful song, gorgeous, and it just carried through the whole mall. It was amazing. We'll have to share it on the socials so people can watch. Yeah. And knowing the history of, of speaking in that place. In that place. You know, yeah. Martin Luther King sharing the stage with Mahalia Jackson and Mavis Staples in 1963, and all of yeah. those. It's a location of history. All the Vietnam stuff, and you know, on and on. So that was beautiful. Ken. Well, I would say for me, the, the hardest part has not been, I, I mean, I share the challenges of like cold calls and booking gigs and promoing things and like, I have a friend who's an artist, visual artist, who is like, doesn't care about the art world, and he just makes art, because that's who he is, he's an artist. And when I met him in my 30s, and I went, yeah, Victor, you're right on, you know? Yeah, I'm an artist, I can just be an artist, I'll make art, you know? And I mean, that doesn't negate the fact you have to make a living, and, and I want to be able to play for people and, and sing, so you find other ways to do it, but for, for me, I would say in many ways, the biggest challenge has been uh, finding a way to um, uh, find a good harmony, a good balance in, in like I, my wife and I just celebrated 41 years together. And 
And so, you know, like that, but that didn't happen by accident. That was the result of a lot of decisions and a lot of collective decisions. And, and neither of us liked having to, for many years, once a week, do the calendar together, you know, look at the calendar. Well, we've got to do the calendar, you know, but nobody, because it, it's always, there's tension around that stuff. But, but that's, you work it out and you can move forward. And uh, so that's, I would say, in some ways, the biggest challenge. Um, you know, I, I feel so blessed in having had so many wonderful uh, experiences. And, uh, you know, I mean, I recounted, you know, 1964, but, you know, uh, it, I guess the, my Mariposa experiences probably culminated in 1979. Uh, I was, had been a big fan for, for many years of the music from the population of the, the Gullah people of South Carolina and, and Georgia, the coastal region of South Carolina and Georgia. And so in, in 1979, the woman who was programming Mariposa gave an hour and a half our group, the original Sloth Band, and Bessie Jones and the Georgia Sea Island Singers. And we just, you know, we just sang together for an hour and a half, and that was pretty great. Folk Alliance has offered me a lot of amazing, you know, sitting in the local 1000 Showcase Free Zone with Pete Seeger on one side and Peter Yarrow on the other, and, you know, stuff like that. But, but it, it, uh, in 1966, when Folk Alliance was in Toronto, uh, playing at Massey Hall, the grand old concert hall of, of Toronto, and playing at, at that with Tom Paxson and Pete Seeger was certainly great. Um, but as I say, I have so many wonderful experiences. Can you tell us a, a special moment in your record producing job? Well, I, you know, the... the oh, is that uh, Sophie's Choice? Is that Sophie's Choice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, which I of get your it. children are you going to take? Yeah, you know, um, my my record production, as I mentioned, as I alluded to, I've been into this a whole idea of recording for a long time, and and in 1973, I forgot to mention that I started running a little coffee house in North York. A friend of mine was running a youth center. They had two portables, and he said, "Well, we don't really need." to use both portables for the youth center, you could turn one into a coffee house. I'd run one on an Opportunities for Youth grant in, in the summer of 1972. And, and so, he, so I, we started, I started a coffee house and we had, you know, Stan Rogers and, and Dan Hill, sometimes when we touch, you know, and uh, you know, uh, you know all, uh, all these different people, you know, people who became close friends of mine. One of them was a struggling songwriter by the name of Rafi. I'd, through my Mariposa connection, I had been doing school stuff. Uh, I actually did a one-year college course in, you know, um, in education, and I had a very brief uh, four-month career as a teacher before they asked me to retire. And uh, so anyway, yeah, Rafi said, you know, Ken, I want to make this, I have this idea to make, you know, I've been, Made, made an album for, of my songs, but my mother-in-law, who runs a nursery school, said, Rafi, you should make one for kids. Will you help me make it? So we went to, I, I'd done a, some recording at uh, these young brothers in, in the Hamilton area, Bob and Daniel Lanois, and we went to uh, their mother's basement and it, in Ancaster, a suburb of Hamil Hamilton. It was 10 bucks an hour, and, uh, you know, made this album, Singable Songs for the Very Young, that you know, w went on to sell three million copies and, you know, worked with Rafi for 11 years uh, touring and, work, you know, doing seven albums with him. And, and that opened up, you know, because once that album became successful, other people began uh, approaching me and, you know, uh, being in, you know, recording in New York with uh, Leon Redbone. It was funny, like, playing on Saturday Night Live was like, it, it was like, just like, you know, and Tom Evans, who was in the group, was like, that's Jane Curtin. You know, that's, those, those are, you know, the, these are, you know, like, uh, that's Gilda Radner. And I'm going, yeah, she seems really nice. You know, I didn't know. I never watched TV. You know? exactly. I don't own a TV even anymore, you know. So. Okay, Robert. Reverend Robert mm. Jones. The hardest part of my job, and I'm going to go to the ministry part. The hardest part of my job is to be around people 
who don't believe. I'm not talking about believing in Jesus or God or any manifestation of deity that you, you know, want to deal with. I'm talking about like folks who just don't think that things happen and that there is a divine hand in what we do. Um, because I've been so blessed by things that I had nothing to do with. <laughs> you know, the phone rings or you meet people and it's just, boom, it's just there. Um, so that's the toughest part is to kind of, you know, Jesus himself said he went to a town and they said he could not heal because of the disbelief that people had, you know. So I find that to be really difficult, but it's, that's, what, that's your job as a, as a minister to deal with folks who don't believe in anything. Um, I think, and I was thinking about that moment, and I had one moment in mind, but, but I thought about something else that happened. We were at the church, and I've been blessed that I married a woman who could sing, but I didn't know she could sing until after I married her, right? So Bernice can sing. Then we had a son, RJ, Robert Jr. He can sing. We have a daughter, Arnesia. She can sing. RJ married a woman named Rosa. She can sing. So now my grandbabies, they can sing. So we're in this church and you have this Black History Month program in February and the kids get together and they put together a program and my daughter actually came to help design this program. It was called Black to the Future, right? <laughs> so the, the idea is that you've got this slave woman who dreams forward. Right? She's, she's afraid of emancipation, but she dreams forward to the things that will happen. So she gets to meet the temptations, she gets to meet uh, Aretha Franklin and all of that stuff. And there's a segment where she encounters a lynching. And my daughter, being my daughter, said, we should, uh, we should play strange fruit. And these kids are like in front of these little trees. And they, that was it. It's because if I wasn't weird, they wouldn't be weird. Exactly. <laughs> Passing the weird torch. <laughs> Passing the weird torch. That's beautiful. Okay, so we have two minutes. Uh, we're, I know, it's just passed by so quickly. Daily practice, one thing, flash, right through, uh, start with Ken. Meditation. And through yoga or? I, I, well, I, it, yeah, when I say meditation, I actually am referring to about 20 minutes of pranayama, uh, half hour meditation, uh, little journaling, uh, and then depending on how much time I have, half an hour to an hour and a half of yoga asanas. Awesome. That's great. Deirdre? I'm not sure I have a daily practice. I, I, I have found a lot of solace in my, the dogs that I have owned, and I strive to be more like them and, in, and, embrace, <laughs> and just embrace the joy of being alive and then taking a nap and then waking up and being glad you're here. So every day I think I strive to be more like my dog, Cooper. Pray and play. Pray every day and play something. Yeah. On something. Touch the instrument. You That's gotta, it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for attending the Wisdom of the Elders panel at Folk Alliance International 2023. Many thanks to our production crew. So, Deirdre McCullough, Reverend Robert Jones, Ken Whiteley, please stand.